a kind of a cool moment um, earlier this week. Bonnie and I, a little insight into us. We, uh, we like to watch The Amazing Race. I don't know if anybody else likes that show, but we've loved it all the time. Well, just this past week, you know, here we are, been, we've been spending all this time in plowing through these New Testament books and letters and all that. And I noticed this, this week on The Amazing Race, one of, the, one of the stops was in Thessalonica. I was like, that is so cool. That is so cool. We're just talking about that. I spent two weeks on 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians just a couple weeks ago. Anyway, it was kind of cool. A reminder that it's real. It's all very real. All right, so uh, today we're in the book of Philemon, and what I'd like us to do is just to jump right into the very first verses of this book. Uh, Paul writes this, verse 1 of chapter 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, to Apthe, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, most people believe that Aphia was Philemon's wife, Archippus, Philemon's son. And the church in the city of Colossae meets right in Philemon's house, right there. Okay, for more than two years during Paul's third missionary journey, Paul ministered in this area of uh, Asia Minor, mostly amongst the people of Ephesus. And this was a really, really fruitful time for Paul and his co-workers because he and all of his friends were leading people to Jesus left and right in Ephesus. Now, one of the people that was converted under Paul's teaching was a guy by the name of Philemon, who is a very wealthy man from, near, from the nearby city of Colossae. We talked about the Colossians just a few weeks ago. Now, we know this guy Philemon had to be very well off because he owned a house that's big enough to house the church in the city of Colossae. Um, So he's in a mansion in the right neighborhood in in Colossae. Now, the way Paul speaks to him leads us to believe that he was really a very, very truly beloved and devoted believer and very central to the leadership of the church of Colossae. Now, in the Bible book that bears Philemon's name, um, actually, it's hard to even call it a book. It's a letter of 23 verses. But in this short letter, Paul refers to him as beloved brother and a fellow worker. And Paul usually reserves those terms for the ones who served for a lengthy time alongside of Paul. Uh, Gospel writers Mark and Luke both are given this title later on in the letter. But clearly there's a friendship, a significant friendship that existed between Paul and Philemon, one that would serve a significant purpose in light of the circumstances that brought about this letter. Now, what was the circumstance? So glad you asked. I'll tell you that in a minute. Uh, First, I want to introduce the very next central character. In verse number eight here, Paul writes, I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. But because of our love, I prefer simply to ask you. Consider this as a request from me, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past. Now remember that phrase. Remember that phrase. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past, but now he's very useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart, Paul says. I wanted to keep him here with me while I'm in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. Now, this is a pretty strong appeal on behalf of this young man, uh, Onesimus. Now, here's the curveball. This writing tells us that Philemon, this pivotal church leader in the city of Colossae, is a slave owner. He's a slave owner. Um, He had at least one slave, possibly many. And just the the subject of slavery is so sensitive and so big and so inflamed, it's hard to even talk about it, even in a historical sense, because it's so heinous. It's so awful in every circumstance at every time for any reason. It's here in the New Testament, commenting on it, treating it as if it's just a part of their world. So we're going to take a look at it. So this slave named Onesimus had escaped from his owner, Philemon, and he ran away from their home in Colossae to Rome in the hope that he could just disappear into the huge crowds of that big city. 
And once there in Rome, Onesimus, either by accident or by his own design, he comes into contact with Paul. Like most people who spend any time with Paul, he ends up coming to faith in Jesus. So now he's a brother in Christ. And he begins helping Paul while Paul is in prison, probably bringing him food from friends and neighbors nearby because a prisoner in those days was not given food or taken care of by the prison at all. They were basically left there to die from starvation or cold or sickness unless friends or family or someone took pity on them and brought them food or a blanket or a coat. They got nothing from the prison. So Onesimus, this escaped slave, becomes one of the community of faith there, serving faithfully. Now remember, this whole part of the world is ruled by the Roman Empire at that time. Roman law dictated daily life. And slavery was widespread across the entire Roman Empire. Most history scholars estimate that as much as one-third of the entire population were slaves. A third of the population. So slavery then was an accepted part of daily life. And in Paul's day, slavery was the bulk of the labor force. And it was quite different than what we think of when we think of slavery in the antebellum U.S. Most slavery way back then had really nothing to do with race. Yes, when one kingdom conquered another, it was common for them to take some of those conquered people and make slaves of them. But most slavery was financial slavery, being sold into servitude to pay a, pay a debt that you couldn't pay. Sometimes a father was sold into slavery in order to preserve his family, to save his family. Sometimes the debt was so overwhelming, the whole family could be sold into slavery. It was just awful. Now, slaves would most often be laborers. What, what most people don't know is that some slaves could actually be doctors. They could be musicians, teachers, artists, accountants. In short, almost all jobs could be and were filled by slaves. Slaves were not legally considered persons at the time, but they were just seen as the tools of their masters. And as such, they could be bought, sold, inherited, exchanged, even seized to pay a debt. And slave masters in the ancient world had virtually unlimited power to punish them and sometimes did so in pretty severe fashion. But by the time of the New Testament now, Slavery was beginning to change a little bit, and realizing that healthy slaves were more productive, masters tended to treat them a little bit more humanely. It was not uncommon for, for a master to teach his slave his own trade, and sometimes masters and slaves became close friends. It also became much more common for slaves to be granted their freedom or given the ability to purchase their freedom. And listen, some slaves enjoyed very favorable conditions under their masters because they were guaranteed food and shelter and care of all kinds, which was a big, big deal back then. Most freedmen, we talked about this a number of years ago, uh, a number of months ago, freedmen were people that were slaves that were then freed. Most of them struggled badly with poverty and too many of them ended right back into slavery. Now, most New Testament scholars believe that this slave Onesimus not only fled from Philemon illegally, but that he also stole some money, uh, maybe to pay for his passage to Rome. Uh, so there was two offenses to deal with. Under Roman law, he could be punished or even killed as an escaped slave. Plus, he stole and he wronged Philemon. And legally, that had to be dealt with. So Paul's message to Philemon was a real, real simple one. Based on the work of love and forgiveness that had happened in Philemon's heart, he's saying, show that same love and grace to this escaped slave and now Christian brother, Onesimus. And Paul's message would have had some extra force behind it because he knew Philemon personally. He was a Christian brother. Paul had explained the gospel to him and had witnessed the profound result. Brand new life coming because of his faith in Jesus. He's a brand new creation. So Paul makes this request here. He wanted Philemon to forgive Onesimus and to accept him as a brother in Christ. Paul did not minimize the sin of Onesimus. He's not ignoring that. And he understands that undoubtedly Philemon was going to be really, really angry with him because of his fleeing and his stealing from him. And because of that, Paul approaches this request very, very gently. He even makes a little play on words uh, in verse 12 here because the name Onesimus means useful. That's what the word, the name means. It means useful. So Paul says this in verse 12. Formerly, he was 
useless to you, but now he's become useful to both you and me. So Paul is, is being gentle and respectful here because he knows that he can just make a demand if he really wanted to. He could just demand it. He could just say, listen, Phil, you're created by God. I'm created by God. Onesimus is created by God. Remember what I taught you. It was in the letter to the Galatians. In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, no male or female, no slave or free. But Christ is in all and is all. So if you think you're better than him, you're wrong. You're wrong. And I love what he says in verse 17 here. Look at this. Paul says, remember, Paul is the leader of Christianity in the world at this time. He says, so if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my very own hand. I will repay it. Look at this. And I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. <laughs> How good is that? Let me, let me tell you what he's saying. Let me give you the CKV of this, the Chip Kelly version, okay? He's saying, hey, remember when I led you to Jesus? Remember that? Now you have eternal life in heaven and all your needs are met. God has given you abundance in this life. And then when you die, you're welcomed into paradise with joy that you can't even imagine. Isn't that great? So if Onesimus took 20 bucks from your estate in Isleworth and you can't get past that, then charge me for it. I'll pay it from what I can scrounge together here in my prison cell where I am jailed for leading people like you to Jesus. So if you need me to pay you that 20 bucks back, you just let me know. And I think Onesimus, I mean, uh, Philemon is going, okay, I get it. I get it. What do you want me to do here? How should I handle this? Well, Paul would say, Onesimus is coming back to you, along with my friend Tychicus. Welcome him as a brother, not a slave. He owes you nothing. And when you're done welcoming him and showing him acceptance as an equal brother in Christ, then turn around and send him back to me because he's very useful to me here in the ministry of the kingdom. Old useless has become useful, and he helps God's kingdom. So, Paul sends Onesimus and this letter back to Philemon, who lives, in, remember, in Colossae. It was too dangerous to travel alone back then, so Paul sends his friend Tychicus along with him, who, by the way, Tychicus is carrying another letter. He's, we studied the letter a few weeks ago, the letter to the Colossians. We know it as the book of Colossians. So in AD 61, from a prison cell in Rome, Paul sends Onesimus and Tychicus and these two letters that would end up in our Bible. It's carrying both of them at that time. Now, there's some important themes at play in this short letter. The most obvious, the biggest and the most obvious is this theme of forgiveness. Forgiveness. C.S. Lewis once said, everyone says that forgiveness is a wonderful idea until he has something to forgive. <laughs> Forgiveness, however, is essential for the restoration of a right relationship between two people that may have hit a bump in the road. Live long enough and you will understand the difficulty of offering forgiveness when you have been wounded. It does not come easily. Yet as believers, we have to recognize that our ability to forgive and our, even our willingness to do it are the result of Christ's saving work on the cross. And because of that fact, Forgiveness serves, serves as a determining factor in who we say we are and how we live our lives. When we don't forgive, bitterness takes hold of our hearts and it chokes out the very vitality of our lives. Failing to forgive, choosing to hang on to a resentment, can become an emotional cancer. A 20th century columnist Ann Lander said this one time, Resentment is like allowing an enemy to live rent-free inside your head. When you really understand forgiveness, you understand that forgiveness is not really for the other person. It's for you. We need to forgive. We must forgive for our own good. So I want all of us in this room to be very, very clear on how Jesus thinks about this. Forgiveness is not just an optional add-on for successful Christian living. 
It is not on a menu, it's not one thing on a menu of options of how to handle someone who has wronged you. It is an imperative of Jesus and an irreplaceable reality in the kingdom of God. If we want life with God like Jesus offers, well then part of it is the openness to allow God to do significant work inside of our hearts, including the forgiving of others. It's got to include the forgiving of others. And to put an exclamation point on this, I want us to look at something Jesus said, and it's a great verse, but I want to zero, as we look at this, I want to zero in not on a phrase, but on one word, just on one word. Jesus says in Luke, Luke chapter 11, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Say that with me. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Look at that word, as. That's one of the most sobering words in the Bible as. British author Charles Williams wrote, no word in English carries a greater possibility of terror than the little word as in that clause. You know how that makes me think? Makes me think, boy, I sure like forgiveness from God. I sure like that. And apparently it's not just vertical forgiveness that God is into. He apparently wants it to be equally horizontal. I am to forgive as I have been forgiven. And he gives us the power to do it. He doesn't just demand it of us. He gives us the power to do it. Now, if you think about it, before we received forgiveness and new life from Jesus, we were all kind of like Onesimus. We were slaves to sin and really in our condition, pretty much useless to our Lord. So Onesimus is pretty much a metaphor for us all. But then Jesus forgave us everything, everything. He welcomed us into his family as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And now he says to us, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And I'm, I hear, forgive as you have forgiven me. 